Hello and very warm welcome to the Arise interview, 60 minutes of big questions about the big stories from the news and beyond with fresh insight and critical analysis. I am Christian Ogodo. Thanks for joining us. Coming up in the next hour, he is a retired general of the first generation, a senior citizen who hails from the northeast of Boronu State where insecurity is highly prevalent. Most importantly, is a Nigerian who is privileged to have witnessed the 1966 to 1970 civil war and through the various changes of government from military to civil rule. He is also a solicitor and advocate of the Supreme Court of Nigeria, is an avid golfer and live president of the Nigerian Professional Golfers Association. His story is an encyclopedia after years of holding several leadership positions in the country. His credentials are applaudable. In the face of uncertainty, he hasn't for once shied away from bringing his vast experience to the fore, commenting on salient national issues. He just joined the club of octogenarians. As he, returned, as he turned 80 years of age on July 25th, the extraordinary Major General Ibrahim Aruna, coming up in a moment. He was part of the 30 young lads from different parts of the country that were recruited into the Boys' Company in 1954, which later metamorphosed into the Nigerian military school in Zaria. Major General Ibrahim Bata Malgui Haruna, otherwise known as IBM Haruna, was one of the young officers given the high commands during Nigeria's civil war and was notably known for playing a significant role that saved Onicha, a city in eastern Nigeria. He grew through the ranks and was retired early at the age of 37. In his era, the country did offer his likes an early stage an opportunity to dwell in a competitive international environment. Nigeria had so much prestige and they were honored to be part of it. Well, so much has changed and today a brazen level of indiscipline can be seen in the Nigerian military and the spate of killings continuing unabated. A clear indication that all cherished values may have been eroded, but not lost. And for more on this, I'm delighted to be joined now by Major General Ibrahim Bata Malgui Aruna, or IBM Aruna for short. He's a retired general of the Nigerian Army. He was a federal commissioner for information and culture between 1975 and 1977. He was also the chairman executive council of Arewa Consultative Forum, a pan-northern Nigeria socio-political group from 2009 to 2012. Very warm welcome, General. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of, I, I like the, uh, I mean, uh, acronym, IBM, but just getting to know the full uh, name now. Yes. Yeah. Tell us, uh, let, let's start with your military experience. You know, you started quite early at 14, you were in the boys' company. And before you knew it, before 21, you were already holding uh, command positions. Tell us your experience. Take us through uh, those experiences in the military. Well, my being in the military was an adventure started by the government of Nigeria when they decided that uh, independence was approaching and the rank and file of the Nigerian army uh, had very little number of uh, indigenous Nigerians as uh, officers commanding and holding responsible positions. So they envisage that um, as independence approaches, there will be consequentially Nigerianization of the, of the army. 
which largely was uh, indigenous people, but led by um, the expatriate British and a few number of Nigerians. So they devised this institution called the Boys Company, the children of veterans um, who have served in the First and Second World War. And my father was a veteran of the Second World War. Um, he left me young, went to the um, East African campaigns and then Burma campaigns, and uh, when he came back in 1946, um, 46, 47, he was uh, demobilized into the Nigerian police force. So I practically joined my father after he returned from the war. Uh, as a barrack boy in the Nigerian police force in Kaduna. Um, from, here, from there, he was posted to Zaria. And by 1952, um, 53, I was in infant uh, uh, primary school. And in 54, I was lucky to be one of the 30 boys, children of veterans who were of, uh, who, who of age. 14 or a little bit above. Um, above. We were recruited by then the most senior Nigerian commissioned officer. He was then a Lieutenant Colonel Wellington Omar Basi, uh, West Africa One. Um, there is this discuss between his ranking with uh, Ironsi. However, they were the senior uh, army, army officers then. Uh, and then during the four years I was in the military school, we interacted uh, with many young Nigerian officers who were brought in to mentor us. Um, there were George Grubo, uh, Abogo Lajima, uh, Mai Malari. Um, there were then the young lieutenants in the Nigerian army. So at the end of my uh, 54 to 58, um, career, uh, I was directly qualified by passing exams <coughs> and um, elections, uh, which led to my going to the regular officers uh, training school in Teshi, now named uh, Ghana Military Academy. I passed through that test of six months training and selection, and went through to um, all the short. Our intake then in um, Ghana was intake 11. We succeeded um, uh, generals to be or to become uh, general or passenger who was on uh, in intake 10. And after all the short, uh, my group had those who were commissioned as short service commission and the younger boys who went on for uh, more training, both uh, military and academic, and uh, got commissioned in the Royal Military Academy by uh, 1961. Uh, in take 27 of the Royal Military Academy, went in in 59 and stayed two years, this is uh, 69. So I was uh, gladly a cadet officer in the military academy when we stood up and uh, gave salute to the independence of our federal republic. Fantastic and rich uh, military history there you've uh, given us, you know, at 80. Uh, we'll uh, join, you know, Nigerians and the world too to say happy birthday, like I noted uh, in uh, a rundown earlier. But now, you held various positions in the military and the rest. Discipline and uh, hierarchical order was highly respected uh, during your own time. You just want to probably look a bit at what you had then and what we are having now in the Nigerian military. Any room for comparison? Of course, there's a great um, room for comparison 
the serving spirit of uh, the soldiers uh, and officers uh, after 1960 um, passed from the subservient attitude of uh, a colonial uh, obey order that is uh, attributed to the, to the soldiers, uh, which popularly came to be known as Zumbi. Or the uh, one that is <laughs> Apes Obey. Apes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Obey. And, um, well, we got, we got our independence, and terms and conditions of service began to change, and attitudes uh, began to change, relationship, and uh, loyalties also began to change between the other ranks and their leading officers who are Nigerians as uh, themselves. Um, but these changes were regulated by terms and conditions of service. But unfortunately, uh, that strong affinity of esprit de corps, of uh, discipline and uh, loyalty, um, along, along the line got uh, tainted. Uh, because as we went on, the, the, the input or the influence of uh, political uh, political feelings um, and awareness uh, began to, to rise amongst uh, the ranks of men and, men and officers. Um, the, 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 the colonial uh, military or the powers never allowed uh, politics to enter into the barracks. In fact, uh, people who were caught reading newspapers then, uh, the pilot, got dismissed from the army. Ser seriously? Seriously. You, you, ca you cannot be hard to engage in uh, uh, political discuss or engagement or even read newspapers. That was uh, the extent to which the, the, the colonial uh, British um, army kept um, the fringes of uh, politics away from the, uh, from the military. But of course, as time went on, as we got independence, um, it, it, could not, it could not be stopped because uh, the nationalist uh, spirit has overtaken that of the uh, colonial sub, uh, subservience. Um, and therefore, events that occurred there after that really got the army into the ditch um, of uh, politics. And what resulted from it has uh, become part and parcel of our national history and politics that is uh, pervading, the, pervading the national uh, atmosphere up to today. Okay, and even uh, the military today, you know, um, I think probably when we return from our commercial break, you would uh, take a very copious look at it. It's a uh, fight against uh, insurgency from where you come, where a lot of uh, decimation of the socio-political and economic lives of the people in the Northeast have been greatly affected. And I'm sure you are one of the very worried elders from uh, that region that, uh, you know, uh, find this uh, kind of uh, trepidation uh, very bad. So, General IBM Aruna will take a short break. When we return, we'll be interrogating more of the issues of the day. You're still watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead. Stay with us. You're welcome back to the Arise interview with me. At the moment, insecurity is Nigeria's challenge as Africa's largest economy. It's struggling to nip this in the bud. Dozens have been killed almost on a daily basis. Fear grips communities. They are left to their fate and won't know where or when the next attack will come. The issues cut across strata from the killings in southern Kaduna to the incessant Boko Haram attacks and raids in the northeastern part of the country to the banditry attacks in the northwest and kidnappings in the south. Many Nigerians feel the issues have been politicized and have overwhelmed the President Muhammadu Buhari-led administration. There are also issues of national cohesion and the public perception 
of an absence of good leadership direction on the part of uh, the leadership structure in this country. I still have with me Major I still have with me Major General Ibrahim Haruna. He's a retired officer, uh, general of the Nigerian Army. He was a federal commissioner for information and culture between 1975 and 1977. He was also the chairman, executive council of Iowa Consultative Forum, a pan-northern Nigeria socio-political group from 2009 to 2012. General, thanks for staying with us. And uh, I'd wanted to get your view. You've told me the perspective of the Nigerian military during your time, how hierarchical orders were maintained and followed, and how stylized the British insul insul insulated the Nigerian military from politics. But when you look at the military, you left several years. You were retired at the age of 37, several years back. That's almost uh, 43 years ago. Do you think they've been up and doing, particularly in the fight against insurgents, bandits, uh, cattle rustlers, and all forms of uh, criminalities perpetrated by criminal elements in the country? Well, for me, coming from the long way of my professional engagement in the Army, I cannot start a commentary or narrative on the situation now on the ground because it's a situation that has built over time. And I see them the way they are related over time and how they have now metamorphosed. When at independence, the army in particular was being Nigerianized, the large population of the soldiers were from the northern region. And most officers who were leading the soldiers were from the southern region. So as we got independence and improved into Nigerianization, the politics of proportional participation came in and the planning was such as to either equalize or balance the command and leadership of the, uh, of the army. And as I said earlier, there were no serious political inputs until after the, the independence. The present scenario that engages the army on internal security and security operations has, had only taken place in the Middle Belt just after independence. And that was the only area the soldiers were engaged in in what was like a political crisis. And of course, that scenario was built out of the political relationship of the political parties that took over Nigeria on the basis of negotiated Federal Republic of Nigeria. However, when you look at the, this crisis, you will see how they have built up from political crisis of election in the Western region to incidents of uh, politics that dislodged the army, the soldiers, from their traditional loyalty to their officers, which led to suspicions and inquiring of orders or command from their officers. So the political evolution had something to do with the military entanglement into politics. Is that the situation today? Well, I want to bring you there. Okay. In fact, I want to bring you to, in fact, this, this situation today is a growth and development evolving from our political situations. All right. If specifically want to want to uh, speak on the present one in the Northeast, you will remember that not long before now, 
there were um, uh, Balatine, there, there was a Mitocine riot. Mitocine yeah. riot. Um, but before that, in the south, there were the um, Boros. Uh, Isaac Boros, uh, 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 yeah, Boros agitation Aten, for agitation. the Niger Delta. Exactly. Mm. And um, this our history of conflicts and uh, confusion grew out of our poor responses to the challenges to security and safety. All these, uh, these uh, little um, pockets uh, from, from, from uh, Boro to um, uh, uh, Middle, Benway, middle, belt. Be middle yeah. belt, uh then to uh, Thieves and uh, um, the Jukuns. Uh, Jukuns. Uh, and the and the Fulani uh, and the challenge brought about with the undertones of uh, religion in um, uh, Yusuf, who was killed by the police. Uh, you know, under circumstances where government were in fact uh, complicit. Complicit. Yes. So all that has has gone on, and um, the suspicion behind the ineffectiveness of uh, the security forces to impact their full weight and responsibility on the incidents has um, been said to be compromised by the political powers and the political forces and the political order. L like if I quickly ask you, in the military and command structure, don't you think or do you support the view that the hierarchy of the Nigerian military have overstayed their time. The hierarchy of the military uh, command that you are not, uh, you are, you are not uh, that has been um, uh, uh, criticized is not the hierarchy of the military in a military role, in a proper military strategically organized force. They are not playing that role as even as is specified by the Constitution. When the military has the role from which we are now criticizing them, it has to be either in aid of the civil power or war. If it is war situation, you will determine exactly who is in command. We have a mixed situation here. We talk about war. But the military is not in command because it is not really war. It is a situation of trying to fight a conflict under a democratic dispensation. That is keeping the peace. But the escalation of it has got to the stage where it is now confusing whether it is aid and civil uh, 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 operation or it's military operation. So the military and the civil are operating more or less in parallel and unless you have true command coordination, they are in conflict. Absolutely. Good place for you to apply the brakes for now because we want to take some messages general. When we return, we'll look at the usefulness of the Nigerian Institute of Policy and Strategic Studies, where you were once chairman. You're watching the Arise interview. We've still got more to come. Stay with us. You're welcome back to the Arise interview with me, Christian Nogodo. We're live in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. And I say have with me Major General Ibrahim Harano, IBM Harano. Yes, General, uh, before we went on break, you were given, you know, the perspective of what the military is today, the, you know, politicization or the creeping of politics into uh, some of the operations that they carry out when there are uprisings, you know, uh, things that are supposed to be eternal security, the military is called in. But what do you think or what do you say 
you are not in support of the sacking of the service chiefs as being canvassed by even the National Assembly and prominent Nigerians because they say the state of insecurity generally in Nigeria is, you know, uh, uncomforting to them. What are your thoughts? My thoughts are many. But their judgment is skewed against what I may say, ignorance. Because as, as much as they are brave to stay in the parliament and say these things, not, many of them are not able to go to their front, to their homes, to their state, to those who voted for them. And we are not in war. So why don't they declare the situation a situation of war where you have no reservations about uh, uh, lethal fighting of um, uh, the enemy uh, or the, the, uh, the insurgents, because it's not the same situation as fighting uh, Biafra. There were two contesting groups with clear lines of uh, combat. So if they cannot go to the situation and they cannot uh, influence it, they don't even know what is really working against the, 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 the commanders, they don't want them removed for just the intrinsic value of putting uh, new commanders. The situation must be under control. So that is a contractual um, uh, uh, relationship, maybe terms and conditions of service, which uh, they, they are criticizing. They, they want uh, persons to change that will not change the situation or will not uh, change their expectations of uh, what the final result uh, will be. There is nobody they are going to hand over uh, uh, territory or, or flag to the commanders as having been defeated. This is a situation they must apply to them, themselves, not only to the politics, of funding of a, of a, of a budget and uh, exploiting uh, uh, commanders uh, on the basis of what they say failure. What is their expectations before they can decide uh, on that basis this is failure? What really is their expectation? They are in a, in, a, in, a, in a democracy. They have been put in place, but they cannot exercise their power. They cannot resign and give it to the territory to proper military operations. It's the same scenario we're having in other uh, challenges. That we don't, we don't carry it, you know, to its logical co conclusions. So, to me, changing the commanders is not even an option because the commanders can be changed. They can be changed even by their troops. It has happened before. It has happened where troops have marched out and which led in some places to revolution. They are not very conversant and really in command of the situation as politicians. They are more journalistic reporters on situations sometimes they hear, hear say. They are not commanders, they should be up there as commanders and in complete unison with the, the, the police and other agencies. The military has, is a lost, last resort. They are, not, they are not trained for this pampering and political uh, negotiations. If you want to commission them to do their uh, through uh, uh, job, give them the territory, they will win it over or they fail it over. But this isolated uh, search for popularity uh, change the commanders. Yes, you change the commanders. Are you putting commanders that are, uh, are not trained with the background like those who are commanding now? Are, are you bring contracting uh, uh, commanders from, from elsewhere? So they should look at the facts and address the facts and address the issues. Okay, General, um, let's uh, leave uh, you know, your constituency uh, out for now. Let's uh, look at, by the time you had left the Nigerian uh, military, you even once headed Nigeria's think tank institution, the Nigerian Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies in Kuru, near Jaws. Do you, if you look at Nigeria's development yesterday, today, and maybe tomorrow, do you think NIPS has met the yearnings of the socio-political and economic development aspiration of this country? NIPS is to examine study, research, and recommend policies. 
They are not policy execute, uh, executors. NIFS is to prepare the manpower who, given the opportunity and chances to serve, will apply the knowledge, the experience they have gained by going to the course in NIFS. During the course in NIFS, they do academic challenges, but they do more than that. They study and travel to many other countries, some with similar situations like us, some others quite diverse from our own, in order to discern what should be done. And if given the opportunity, what can they do? So the NIFS graduates have melted down into various in institutions in this country, both civil, public, uh, private. And military. Yes, and, and they are contributing. Quite some of them are influential in the political arena. But Similarly, uh, the Institute of uh, International Affairs, which yes, I was privileged to lead, yeah. the same thing. We are like a research institute, we are like a manpower development uh, uh, resource um, institute, providing resource personnel who would apply their knowledge and experience um, when given the opportunity or influence those who are in the stage and um, uh, see if uh, things can move on in a positive way. Yes, in a positive way. That was in the light that I asked that question. You know, the contribution of such think tank institutions. When you look at Nigeria during your own time, Nigeria was far ahead of India, far ahead of China, the same as uh, Brazil, Malaysia, Indonesia, put together because of its resources, human and material, that the regions were utilizing very copiously. Would you, for example, looking at that time and now, be talking or asking for restructuring? Should Nigeria be restructured? <laughs> Nigeria has been restructured. It depends on what kind of uh, restructuring. Because over the, the time of... Um, uh, Babangida's regime, uh, uh, other regimes, you know how much influence our economic structure in particular has gone through. The, the, um, the strategy that was adopted during uh, Babangida's time. Structural adjustment program. That was Babangida. Yes. Then after Babangida, there was, there was this strategy that was sold out to us by the World Bank, IMF, mm. and um, uh, uh, the International Finance and International uh, Company, yeah. led, led by a spearhead of a technical person and supporters. That is uh, Okonji Iwala's uh, regime. Mm in uh, managing the economy. Yeah. They got us, after the failure of stru structural adjustment, to their needs. And needs the forgiveness needs. of our debt. That's it. Yeah. Now, when you have internally inspired and motivated policy advisors, and you have those in authority, are not necessarily uh, convinced or rather they, they're not accepting your advice necessarily yeah. advising and or they're not they committed are vast to, to it yes. yeah. they, they take what they want and throw away what they want or test the tenacity of um, their subjects and the policies we had adopted which was inherited from this uh, uh, influential monetary um, international monetary. you know that that has led us to the situation we are now because it it built this large sea or a oasis of corruption and we ran into the kind of corruption that it is mind-boggling how much has been floated out of the, this country and and uh, and and invested in, in, uh, in other countries. 
Now, you, you are not looking at uh, the politics of uh, zoning here. You see, the agitation about restructuring is, look, let's go back to regionalism. Give us, reduce the size of the federal government. Take away some functions. Give it to the states and the rest so that the states can be paying taxes or the regions to the center. That is one. Then two, what do you say of uh, uh, Madam, uh, Maman Daura's new uh, political uh, conjecture that the best in the country should be made to contest election and no zoning? What are your thoughts there? Are you against zoning or for zoning? You are putting too many questions against me. Too many issues. Okay? All right. right. You talk about zoning and uh, uh, structural, physical, or, um, or, or economic uh, restructuring. Mm. Now, this had been addressed in the various reforms, and they have failed. It is okay to ask for these structural reforms. Mm. They appear like a beautiful lady that is well polished in the face and well lived. But what will be the character? We've gone from four regions to 36 states and a federal character. Has our character truly really changed in terms of the relationship in governance all for the benefit of the people? They were all military creations. Thank you very much. Because uh, the military were the intellectuals. It is easy. Of course, the easiest thing we do in Nigeria is to put a symbol of an identity and kill it and leave the problems. After all, the first school that started in this country that led us into all these damages, we are based on the, on, on the precept that there was uh, 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 corruption of the leaders and of the economy. That's 1966. If you go back to the speech of uh, Major Nzogu, so the premise was corruption. It was your colleague in the military. Yes. Does that make me, does that make me a coup maker? Does that mean me that I support those values? You know, we may have gone to discuss, was I briefed about this coup? Was, uh, uh, the coup? Many people were not consulted. And I've said here, that was the beginning of the complete destruction of loyalty and obedience of the soldier to the officer. The officer would never have had the courage to question the other of his officer. But from there on, that breach of trust, we still have to overcome it. Because every policy that is being enunciated in this country is always also being seen with that suspicious eye as what is the motive, instead of what is the good so that we can all chip in collaborate and make it success, a success of it. So at the end of the day, we are in a situation where the leadership, the sector, all the sector, traditional rulers, economic, um, the bureaucrats, uh, private sector, they must put their acts together so that we, the people underneath, can see the good and trust them in good faith to do what they have promised us to do. And that is the political leadership we are hoping we will evolve under democracy. You, you, you are still hoping, just like uh, other Nigerians, for a political leadership that will, you know, sustain Nigeria's developmental uh, growth. How about the issue being canvassed now that to have the best of the leader particularly for the presidency, can come from anywhere. It shouldn't be zoned. Are you for zoning or against zoning? No, I'm not a politician. I'm not in a political party. You are a Nigerian? I'm a Nigerian. And my view is that you have not asked me for my own strategy. It was people who campaigned for zoning. And uh, you are now using it as a standard of judgment of the ideals for this country. I don't necessarily support it. If things has evolved properly by now, Nigerians by, would be led by those who are judged generally by the citizens as being competent and capable 
to carry out the assignment of moving Nigeria as a whole forward. So the dialogue must be continued in good faith. Not that people have some particular interests which they want to protect and which they may have been protecting as a way of moving forward. You cannot move forward like that, doing the same thing, entrenching the same group of people. You cannot, because sometimes the issues is not just uh, geopolitical. The issues go down to, 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 to the national ethics, the national morality. What are the leaders to carry forward? Is it this divide and rule? Divide and gain? Divine to, to sit perpetually on power? And the power that is now being used is the power to have authority to, to use up? Corruption. You have, we have to go back to what I believe is a workable system from the ground up. Not only setting standards and morals, but making sure that there is equity. There, are, there is a province, for example, in Nigeria that has remained a province, and it has seen districts, some districts or provinces, they have become states. Or Goja province. For example, and, uh, and um, between Kwara and, uh, and, uh, and Kogi. Kogi. And you, see, you can see in the, the, the notice are asking that, oh, if the others have become so many states, it doesn't matter on land size or population, we should have equal number of states. So the rational and basis on which the leaders come to negotiate may be founded on what they feel is just, but not necessarily justice or equity. So you think there has really been a huge leadership failure in this country, and particularly when you look at uh, our leaders uh, from uh, time past to now, they fall within uh, your category. I mean, your, your age group and the rest. And the youths will be wondering, what legacies have they or are they leaving for us? Well, one of, one of the legacies is that you should also use your intellect, debate and find something to improve what you have inherited. Because the blame game can go on and on and on. My own generation, who started coups like in 1966, had genuine commitment because they did not understand the conspiracies that was working behind them. But now we have better educated segment of the society in all walks of life. So if you, if you stand on sovereign national councils, you have to overcome the the, 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 the preponderances of difficulty in really getting uh, sovereign uh, uh, national conference. But there is a way you can get together wise men and intelligent men who know how to divide power within this country for a stable de development. But it's not only that. It is the issue how much do the people know to choose who they support. Now the basis is how much has the man brought and not caring how much uh, uh, clean what he has brought to influence us to, to, to vote for him. It's like business uh, investment. And business investment for where we got it from in England did not start with all honesty and trust. That is why they had to find ways of legalizing people who collected money um, uh, to go to the, to the Eastern world or to the Western world, you know, to bring them riches which never came back. And even in, uh, in America, there are people who got the st stock subscription for gold fields that never existed. So corruption is part and parcel of um, progression. But you can use it 
negatively or positively. Positively, if all our, our people who stole our money and bought hotels and lodged in, uh, in, uh, uh, in other countries and so on, if they had invested it in this country, we wouldn't have had so much difficulty with our hospitals or what you call uh, social medical services or with education. Or infrastructure. Our infrastructure. But I thought this government, I mean, for some, a lot, uh, for uh, some Nigerians, this government is uh, really doing its utmost in the anti-corruption war. They say they've recovered uh, almost a trillion uh, naira from looters and, and the rest. Yeah, but even success has its imperfections. They have succeeded in a way, but they have not stopped uh, uh, some uh, corruption and uh, stealing in the process or in, in the system. And they cannot. Like it's been alleged uh, uh, in, the, yes. in the Niger Delta Development Commission, the uh, Northeast Development Commission of just yesterday, yes. 100 billion is uh, in the air. And they cannot even successfully uncover all the monies that have fizzled, been fizzled out of this country, let, let alone talk about bringing, them, uh, you know, bringing it back. Because some of the monies were hedged and hidden under some security codes of people. And you can, you can never get it back unless uh, the person involved, uh, involves it, uh, yes, or, or he dies and um, uh, the money can uh, end up in the hands of caretakers because they big, buy big mansions. The mansions are undeclared. They don't pay tax on their earnings. And uh, when they go, uh, n nobody has um, a, a will to, you know, to collect it. Okay, uh, General, let's look at uh, some of uh, your social life, you know, those that really keep you going at 80 and your memory is still very sharp, you know, spot on and the rest. You're the life president of Nigeria's Professional Golfers Association, uh, even uh, life patron at the IBB Golf and Country Club. You must be missing some golf now because of the pandemic. Yes. Not only am I missing golf, my professional golfers are crying out mm -hmm. that they should be allowed to resume golfing because it's a non-contact game and uh, it's a game that is evolved uh, in the background. Uh, practicing, getting promoters uh, pro um, and support. The, the thing that comes to the forefront um, is the tournaments and the games. Which, which are not, you know, in uh -huh. existence now so, because of the pandemic. And to prepare for that and get sponsors, you must be practicing, you must be playing, you must be advocating, you must be uh, playing some little games. But the important thing is that the pan David... Um, uh, the COVID-19 mm. um, can sufficiently regulate the plane of the game without detriment to the health of anybody. Of anybody. Yes, indeed. One worrisome this thing about God, because I know you used to be a troika, you know, in, in, in the, in the, from the military to the golfing world and the rest. One is of blessed memory now, General Mobolaji Johnson. Your other friend and uh, golfing mate, uh, uh, His Royal Majesty Alfred J.T. Spieff, yeah. was here a few weeks ago, too. Yeah. And the most significant thing here is the Nigerian Open Golf Championship. It was last played in 1997. That was the 25th mm. uh, Nigerian Open. Mm. With this uh, COVID-19, we may just not see it resurrected again or resuscitated. Yes, we, we must put our best endeavor to not just to resuscitate it, but to allow the, the games of golf, uh, you know, to grow alongside with other sports that Nigeria can uh, develop. It's so unfortunate that um, when, 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 you, when you read through that uh, uh, Vision 2010, Vision uh, 2020, you will find amazingly where we would have been today if that vision was um, followed, through. followed and pursued. Well, 
Let's uh, review your own vision very quickly. When you were Minister of Information and Culture, you, you know, transformed the Nigerian television then to the Nigerian Television Authority. Would you say several years after, in one minute, NTA as a national broadcaster has met your yearnings and aspirations? The NTA is now the largest television station, the largest uh, reach. I would, did not see or foresee that it will come to be so big and so influential and so great. Our idea then was that we had the, uh, this challenge of uh, the fusing influence of Nigerians and its probability of um, creating more conflict. So the, 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 the experimental balloon that first came, yes, that first came yeah. was to make That's the, satellite. Larger, the yeah. satellite. Yeah. So we said in the challenges we are now meeting, if we can consolidate oh, information all right. in, the, in the country, so let's use our resources for the best effect to influence Nigeria as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, General I.B. Haruno. I wish they shake, but we can chop <laughs> off uh, no, All right, thank you. Thank you very thank much, you, uh, General I.B. Haruno, for thank coming you. on the Arise interview. Thank you very much. Well, that's it for this edition of the Arise interview. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.